It's Big Ten Championship Week, folks, so why not do a special edition here, Hawkeyes Live. Appreciate everyone stopping by, bring those comments and questions. we got Elliot Clough right here from Iowa Rivals breaking down the Hawkeyes for us. Elliot, what's going on today? Mark, you know, today is one of those not-so-busy days. I just was telling you all about the, the month of November, but uh, things are... Starting to slow down, I guess, before they get crazy once again this weekend. Heading to, to Indy tomorrow. Going to watch a recruit workout. Then uh, got the game on Saturday. Sticking around for Iowa versus Purdue basketball on, on Monday as well. So um, taking the little bit of time to rest that I can today. Well, we appreciate you breaking up your, your work or making – delaying your rest, whatever you're doing for us. Well, <laughs> we appreciate you stopping by for a few minutes. Uh, this is the championship game. Since, you know, you were locked in on Iowa, we're kind of taking this from opposite ends of the spectrum. You're, you're locked in on everything. Hawkeyes. I got the national perspective. We're doing different games, different championship games, talking to all sorts of people across the country. Of course, this is the one that just about uh, everyone dismisses. We just talked to our handicapper here steve merrill from wager talk this is the largest point spread in championship game history the lowest uh point total of course in championship history that goes without saying obviously <laughs> yeah but, uh, I, go ahead yeah but the the hawkeyes punchers shot what does that look like man i've been on a a, a couple podcast this week and the thing that i just keep coming back to is that iowa just has to be perfect i mean like with the sheer amount of injuries they've had this season throw in the fact that their backup quarterback who has started i think like six seven eight games now didn't play competitive football for like two or three years there and he's doing that finally this year was completing 36 percent of his passes prior to a couple weeks ago, flipped it. It's now at 63, which is obviously positive. There's a, kind of a strange discrepancy between talent and who's playing at the running back position with Caleb Johnson, LeSean Williams, Jazz Patterson. I think Caleb Johnson's the most talented running back in that room for sure. Whether he's put it on the field or not is one thing. And then you look at the injuries to their All-American tight ends, potentially All-American tight ends, and Luke Lachey and Eric All. Those guys go down for the season, and then you lose your best player in Cooper Jean a couple of weeks ago. So you can't bank on the fact that – I mean, I don't necessarily know that you could bank on it anyway, but that little bit of hope where you have, oh, Cooper's on the field, anything can happen, gone. Completely gone on special teams and on defense. And I think you think more so about scoring on special teams, and especially with the way he's returned the ball this year. Just one, one score, should be two. Um, punt return for a touchdown could very well happen again in, in the championship game. He would have been more than likely defending Roman Wilson in the passing game, but you got to hope to get JJ McCarthy off his spot. You got to hope to force him to make turn or, you know, make throws. He's not a guy that throws the ball away. You got to hope that he throws the ball and, and is intercepted frequently. The ball ends up on the ground. Tory Taylor, you hope and pray he can pin him deep depending on, you know, field positioning and such. And you can't have Drew Stevens have two block field goals again or a block field goal. You got to take all the points you can possibly get. And with that said, the Iowa offense has to finish drives. You can't leave drives. You can't leave points on the board. And that's something they've done all season against teams that are far inferior to a team like Michigan. You can't do it. The defense will do their thing, right? Like this is one of the best defenses in the country, top 10 defense in the country. Michigan is a top five defense in the country. So you're hoping and praying the offense can do something, can get the run game going at the very least, and maybe that'll open things up for Deacon Hill. They're going to get him on the move. You know, more so in the Rutgers game than anything past or, or, or I guess, previous or hither closer to this time um, in the Rutgers game. That was the first time this season where I felt like I didn't know what Iowa's offensive tendencies were going to be what they were going to be doing. It's like, oh, it's a play action. I thought they were running the ball. It's first down, you know? Like, and that's something that I know Corey has talked about a good amount is their tendencies. And that was the first time this season where I felt like I didn't know what was happening on the offensive, you know, in the ensuing play. And 
that was the first time I think we've really seen complimentary football from the Hawkeyes this season. And we've seen it a little bit here and there. That halftime score against Nebraska should have been 21-0. Like, you can't, you just can't leave those type of opportunities on the field. I mean, I don't know if you were able to watch the game, but Caleb Brown had that would have been touchdown catch. Oh, yeah. And he catches it with his body or tries to catch it with his body. Dog, you're supposed to be the most talented guy on the field right now. What are we doing? I know That's he's what we all used to do in the backyard, you know. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I have how to catch a football. Yeah. I have a vivid memory of fifth grade tackle football where I missed an interception because I went like that. You know? Like, and I'm the skinny kid who probably weighed like 60 pounds at that point in time. And that still haunts me, you know, (laughs) like that's something that Caleb Brown has to know at this point in time, whether he's been a running back before or not. Some of those things, all of those points can't be left on the board. It's just that simple. And you got to hope Michigan makes mistakes and you got to play perfect in just about every facet. That's the only way this, this game ends up in an upset. So many funny things that you brought up there, Elliot, with all of that. Uh, We could have been watching these games together because, yeah, that same thing went through my mind on the Caleb Brown. I thought, this guy, uh, he was signed by Ohio State. He was a top 75 receiver, and now he's their best playmaker. And, that you know, it's not like I'm, okay, he's he's so worthless. He's he's garbage. Uh, Like, but it was just kind of strange. Okay, that, that was a bit. And. I actually tweeted out something about Caleb Brown missing that football, dropping that ball, and somebody shot back at me, and it it almost had a tinge of, is this person connected to Caleb Brown in some way? Because then he said, he's he's got uh, some of the best hands in the country. And I didn't want to make this this like trash fest of Caleb Brown because I didn't intend it that way to trash him in any way, but I did say something like, and I just double checked myself. I looked up his stats, 11 catches on the season. I'm thinking I've seen him drop three passes myself. So that ratio isn't the best. <laughs> so. Best hands in the country. What's your, what's your, like, what's your sample size? What are you referring to when you say that? Cause like you catches. said, <laughs> exactly. And we've seen him, he had opportunities early on in the season and just drop balls. Like, what are we, what are we talking about here? And, and again, I, I have no desire to, to talk crap about Caleb exactly. Brown either. He's the best playmaker on that offense right now. But that's a that's a silly point to think you've made against somebody who's watching the games, you know. Corey, before we get to you, thanks for dropping by. I wanted to hit Elliot with something else because he just kind of ran down um uh, you know the progress of the Iowa offense. Deacon Hill 36%, 63% in the most recent games. But I like you, Elliot, watching the Rutgers game thought Okay, this is this is let's not confuse it with some prolific passing offense or anything, but this is probably Iowa not at its best, but something close to its best, functioning at a very high level. 400 yards of total offense, I think, was the best in two and a half years since the Maryland game a couple of years ago. But this is Iowa's offense functioning at a high level, running the ball against a good defense, not a great defense good defense, mid-tier Big Ten defense. And so this is probably what it should look like. It's what they want to look like, right? Whether they have or not is one thing. When you've got a lame duck offensive coordinator who doesn't want to wear Iowa Hawkeye logos, uh, we'll, we'll see if that actually continues to happen or not or even happens in this game on, on Saturday. But, yeah, that, that Rutgers game was pretty much exactly what the Iowa Hawkeyes want to be offensively defensively we've heard about complimentary football all year while they're saying that the offense was putrid when they were really hammering that home compliment well we want to be complimentary well you're not being complimentary you know (laughs) like um that is truly the only time all season that i've that i've seen it um and it really come into full effect there's been moments there's been quarters but there wasn't a complete game like that where they did ultimately win that that 22 to zero but Corey, how long have they been selling complimentary football? And it's that's not the definition of complimentary football. That okay. is your defense is propping up and your special teams propping up the offense. Yeah, I think you'd have to ask Kirk Ferentz what the definition of complimentary football is because he's been touting that for a long time. Um, but I will say it took me a while. And again, I mean, these last three years have been fairly 
consistent, consistently bad offensively. However, it took me about, I think I was up, we were up in Madison and I'm watching this game and, and how they approach that, the uh, short yardage situations near midfield against the Badgers. And it was at that moment where I kind of started to realize what Kirk is doing. And maybe it's just because I'm really slow and really dumb, but like <laughs> it, it does work more often than not. That's what's crazy about it. So I think his definition of complementary football is different than ours in that we believe complementary football means your offense scores, your defense holds, your offense scores, your defense holds. Like that's the simple gist of it. Whereas his definition of complementary football, I think would be more so our offense gets a couple of first downs here and there, here or there. We rely on our punter to pin the other team back. We really utilize our gunners to pin the other team back. Then the offense gets into field goal range, tacks on three points on a short field. You know, you're right, though, Elliot. That's not, I mean, none of us want that as far as this team being able to take the next step. And in a game like this, uh, that approach is going to be very hard to uh, execute to the level it needs to execute at. Um, I think it starts there. I think they've got to control the field against Michigan on Saturday. Um, you you, ha you cannot average 42, punt, 42 yards per punt with a potential Ray Guy award winner in Tory Taylor. I think he'll punt the ball better with a warmer climate there indoors. Um, I think Drew Stevens will, you know, Drew Stevens is dealing with an injury. Um, you know, you go back and watch some of what happened on Saturday. I, I'm not making excuses for Drew because, you know, I think it was obviously the right move to, move meter into the, the lineup in that second half. But uh, there were some things, uh, if you go back and watch those two blocks last week, um, there were some things about those kicks that meter didn't have to deal with, particularly a loaded up right side of the line of scrimmage on that angle. I think it was a second kick that he got blocked. Um, and again, he has been dealing with a groin injury for the last week. I think he'll be fine. My guess is warmer atmosphere again will help Drew Stevens to play better. Um, I said on my show with Don Patterson here that released half of it yesterday. And I think the other half is going to be released this evening. What if Iowa pops off a kick return? Like what if Caden Weijin runs one back? Um, what if Caden Weijin runs a punt return back? You know, that changes the game completely. And as great as Cooper Jean was, we haven't had any kick return for touchdowns. It's kind of a lost art in the game of college football nowadays, but what if that happens somehow on Saturday? It's possible. Um, you know, Iowa plays with a slim margin for error, but at the same time, boy, with as good as the defense is, if you can get so, some sort of an unconventional or non-traditional touchdown, I think it changes the game. So, um, you know, the only, the only gripe I'd have with what Elliot said is him and I disagree on, on the running back position. Um, I, I think their best back right now is Leshawn and, you know, with that said, Corey. I don't. I don't necessarily. I think on field product, Leshawn is is definitely their best running back right now. I was just talking about pure talent. I, yeah. I didn't think. Yeah. I mean, do you, well, do you yeah. agree with me there? Um. Yeah. I mean, I, what's I mean, he's a four star. What's your, what's your definition of talent? How would you evaluate talent with a running back? When we're talking about, uh, I guess, talent generally, what I'm thinking of and what I'm referencing, I suppose, is 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 potential. Also, Caleb Brown. When you're talking about top speed. That's what we're talking about right now, like in terms of the clear distinction between him and Leshawn. That's the first thing I think of is that top speed. Two, I think he'd be better at breaking tackles if he ran more aggressively, which mm, I think he's yeah. capable of. It's things yeah. that, that he's capable of that he's just not doing, in, in my opinion. Well, I guess, yeah, I, I see. I absolutely see where you're coming from. My my question would be, you know, this is end of year two. Why, why isn't he running – with better aggression. Why hasn't he shown the ability to lower the shoulder pads? I agree with you. He, he's got size that you can't teach. He's got that right. long stride. He's got the breakaway speed. I don't think Leishon's breakaway speed is that all that bad. We saw some breakaway speed on that long run against Wisconsin and a couple other long runs this year, but no, you're right. The, the fastest um, running back on this team is, is Caleb. I just wish he would utilize his body better. He's, you know, we oh, talked yeah. about how big he is and how impressive he looks. He doesn't put his foot in the ground. Um, you know, we haven't seen his ability to jump cut very effectively in tight space like we've seen from Jazz and from especially from Leshawn. And so you're, you're, I, I see where you're coming from on that. I, I, 
I just want to know if if he's got the ability to do that. When are we going to see it shine through? Um, so as of right now, like I'm I'm starting Leishon. He's the first guy out of the pin on Saturday yeah. for me. Um, I the thing I'll say about Leishon too is he has a knack for finding a crease and exposing it, whereas Jazz is a C hole hit hole. Leishon yeah. finds a crease. It's aggressive patience is the way I, yeah. I describe yeah. the way Leishon runs the ball. Yeah, Le- um, Leishon's the most complete guy, right? Right now, yeah. he, he's just, yep. and, and that's from a vision standpoint too. I think you're absolutely right. Like Jazz and Caleb are like the the almost the polar opposites of one another, because Caleb yeah. is this really big back who doesn't hit hard, uh, and Jazz is a guy who is not a very big back, hits really hard. Sometimes I don't think is patient enough, and is just gonna blast whoever's in front of him, which can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Whereas Leishon is kind of your well-rounded back, uh, maybe with the least amount of upside of the three, but yeah. right now he's your best, he's your most complete, reliable guy. So, um, you know, I wish we could have seen Jazz stay healthy after his performance against Iowa State. You know, maybe that have made a difference for him. I think he's got the potential to be really good. We've talked about him on this show, but um, you know, the bottom line is somebody asked in the, the chat earlier, how does Michigan play Iowa? I, I cannot imagine a scenario in which Michigan does not load up the box almost every down against Iowa. I just don't see why you wouldn't. Because if you stop Maybe the run, you. yeah, if you stop the run, Iowa has nothing. They have nothing. Nothing. And Michigan has two great corners. Yeah, I mean <laughs> Uh, it would be absolutely ridiculous to play Michigan the way or to play Iowa the way Michigan kind of played Ohio State um, because obviously uh, the difference out wide. So uh, that's what I expect. And that's going to create long yardage situations on critical downs. And the good news is Iowa has been better on critical downs over the last month, but they're still not great. And and collectively for the season, they're toward the bottom of the Big Ten. So, you know, Deacon putting Deacon in situations where you're you know, obvious passing downs on uh, passing situations on third down is not going to be ideal. Um, I, I don't know if the answer out wide is Caleb Brown. I'd like to think it is, but like you guys illustrated earlier, he's he's had a tendency to drop some passes. Um, frankly, I think Deontay Vines has done almost nothing this year. Frankly, can we just we be clear on that? He's given as far as um, as far as pass catching. I don't even know how many yards he has in the season. He's been dinged up. He was projected to be maybe the number one guy. He's given them nothing out wide, like nothing over the top, nothing in the passing game. So I think it has to be Caleb Brown and Addison Estringa. It's been really inconsistent from Deontay. We're talking about the um, the production from him. The first two things I think of are the what like two yard touchdown against Western Michigan, and then that absolutely freaking wild catch he made against Minnesota. He had that first half against Minnesota where he caught like six passes or four passes okay, or yeah. whatever it was. And other than that, I, I, for the most part, agree with you, um, Corey. He'll be back this weekend. I talked to him on the field before the Nebraska game. Um, I know Kirk wasn't exactly – he's back. It was, yeah, we expect him to be back. He'll he'll play this weekend but based on what he told me. Um, and, I mean, over these last few weeks with Deontay out, I'm sure you guys are going to agree with me, the offense has been better. You, you trust Caleb Brown to make a play in the open field. And there were, I don't know if we had this conversation, Corey, I think we might have, but early on in the season, especially when Deacon was first getting reps, what you want for a guy who's inexperienced like that, especially to start the game is to start it like wide receiver screens, running back screens, something that's simple, get him completions, get him confidence, get him in a rhythm. They didn't do that. They did it maybe like once in a, uh, a receiver screen or a couple of receiver screens with, uh, Deontay Vines and maybe one with Nico Ragaini, but why aren't you getting the ball to a guy like Caleb Brown who can make a play in the open field? And now they're doing it and they're doing it too much. They did it. Uh, he scored his first touchdown. I believe it was on a receiver screen, made a play. And then they did it a couple times against Nebraska and Nebraska read it and snuffed it out like that. Well, I'll say this too, uh, as it relates to what you just said, I absolutely think you're right. The passing game has been so much better since Caleb Brown's been playing. And that is not a result. I mean, from what it appears to us and based on you, know, I'm not there for the press conferences like you are every Tuesday, uh, Elliot, but based on the lingo from Kirk Ferentz, Caleb Brown's playing more because Deontay Vines has been hurt. But here's what that tells me. That's an indictment on our ability to evaluate 
the wide receiver position. Because if <laughs> it takes a guy getting hurt <laughs> to see how much better his backup is, why was Deontay starting in the first place? Um, yeah, Caleb's had an issue with, with uh, drops, but frankly, I'll, I'll take that risk of drops um, with his playmaking ability, with his speed, with his route, route running, and the potential to make big plays. We just not, have not seen that potential from Deontay yet. So, um, you know, it'll be nice to have a full state. Hopefully, those both those guys are electric on Saturday. Um, I don't trust Deacon Hill. I'll be quite frank. I don't trust him uh, in a big game. I don't trust his ability to come out and maintain that level of accuracy we've seen over the last few weeks just because he doesn't have that groove throwing motion that you typically want in a quarterback kind of throws from the hip we've talked about that time and time again um, but we've seen him perform well on certain days and that's going to happen I mean he, he can um, yeah, I just don't know how consistent it can be so uh, yeah I, 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 I agree with you on all that you mentioned the issues of of drops with Caleb Brown. I mean, who that's healthy on the roster hasn't had an issue with drops right now besides Addison Alstranga. Well, that again, has, that what has is played that? consistently. Yeah, and as I've said over and over again, uh, who, who does that reflect on? If everybody's having the same issue, it reflects on the coaching staff to me. And that's it's you know whether you want to talk about Brian, I think it's more you you got to point the finger at Kelton Copeland. So and those are discussions you can have after the season, but. What has Kelton done with this wide receiver room? Uh, he's a nice guy. I'm sure his players love him, but they have not gotten the production out of that room that they need to. And the fact that drops continue to be an issue, even for a guy as talented as Caleb Brown, a guy as old as Nico Rakaini, um, you know, that's a problem. The tight ends ain't dropping passes, Elliot. You know, Seth? Nope. Yeah. I mean, when do we see Addison Estringa and even Stilianos? I mean, he's been t- targeted much, but certainly not Eric All or, or Luke Lachey. So, um, you know, they got to, the, the, the key on Saturday to me is just they, they got to figure out a way to um, get on the board first, get a lead, even if it's 3 0. I know that doesn't seem like much, but playing from behind against a team like Michigan with a guy like Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards. That is just going to be um, almost an impossible task. When when you're putting a bunch of pass heavy scenarios with your offense, you're you're going to be in trouble. So I just hope they can figure out a way. Um, maybe it's not on the first drive. Maybe they don't take the ball first. I get. I'm guessing they will take the ball first. Try to get a couple of first downs, which is kind of how they <laughs> play the game. They're not trying to score the, that first drive so much as just getting the the uh, field flipped. And uh, if you can pin Michigan back, maybe you can get a, a field goal or a touchdown on that second drive. And Corey, that's where I'll push back on your explanation of complimentary football or the way they would see complimentary football. And I certainly appreciate your take when you came back from that Wisconsin game, because you explained it on our show, similarly to the way you just explained it. And it kind of hit me as well as, okay, yes. I get this to a better degree than I got it before in regards to them playing risk reward and placing that risk burden on their defense and not their offense and saying, just keep punting, just keep punting. We'll let them make the mistake. We don't want to make the mistake on offense. I totally get that. But in regards to uh, complimentary football being offense scores, defense shuts them down offense scores defense shut well that's that's a juggernaut is what that is that's a 56 nothing you know game uh protect the football maintain the football don't have the least number of yardage stats in the nation because you at least want to move the football far enough to punt it and use Tory Taylor which they do on occasion if even if you don't drive at 75 yards for a touchdown, maintain the football, protect the football, which they haven't necessarily done. I've I've run the comps on the six opponents that they in Michigan share, and I was at a minus two turnover margin in those games. So they've been more sloppy with the football than they should be, considering their limitations, and they haven't placed their defense in the best positions as they haven't the last couple of years. And that's that's why I'm just pushing up back against the complimentary football being a legitimate stance. They are normally very, um, very good in turnover margin. 
because typically Phil Parker's defenses create a lot of turnovers, specifically interceptions. They have not been as productive with that this year. Um, you know, could you argue part of that is injuries in the in the defensive backfield? Yeah, maybe they always seem to get banged up back there. Cooper's been out. Jamari was out first couple games due to the betting stuff. Um, and then they've been sloppier because I think partly Cade was hurt when he was playing. Deacon is not very good. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, frankly, I mean, Elliot, you said it really. I mean, he's just not very good. He's 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 getting by right now. He's playing better, but he's you know. He is a lower Big Ten tier level quarterback. And so, I mean, that's what makes it even more impressive that they've won 10 games is because what you just said, Mark, that they don't they aren't dominating on turnover margin and they've had some issues with place kicking. Now they've been pretty good most of the year with place kicking, but they've been you look at the year as a whole, with especially these last couple of games from Drew, haven't been that good. Um Tor- these Tor- last if I can interrupt, Corey, just to to uh quantify that, 10 of 17. Over the last two months, that's fifty nine percent. That's a failing grade. Yeah, and and I don't know. I mean, I go back and look at some of those. There have been uh, several blocks in there. I don't know. You know, again, everybody wants to condemn Drew for all the blocks. There are multiple facets of getting blocked, right? And and they give yep. him. They've given him longer kicks because they have confidence in him. Fifty plus. He missed a fifty three yarder. I think it was. Was it last week or week before? Not to excuse that because he should be making those, um, but. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they've been able to accomplish what they've accomplished with all that being said is impressive. Um, I think the the better question and the the big issue that we need to address here is, Elliot, are you going to hit up the beef house on the way out to Indy? Uh, What's the beef house? Oh, (laughs) sorry, guys. Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, uh, Don Patterson will tell you, back when he coached at Western, uh, every time they'd go out to Terre Haute for – a game at Indiana State, they'd stop at the Beef House. And he actually told a story, and again, I'll publish this this evening on the show, but he was telling a story on the podcast about how um, there was one year where they were not playing very well at Indiana State. And he told his guys at halftime, he said, well, we can always just stop by McDonald's on the way home. We don't have to go to the Beef House. And he said, well, what do you know? We played better and won the second half. <laughs> so, anyways, it's uh, if you go along I-75, I've never been there. I'm, I'm going to, I plan on stopping there, but uh, it's, it's, Apparently an iconic thing. There, there's big signs oh. along I-74. Uh, Mark, have you done it before? I have not. But where are we talking about exactly? I don't even know if I've been in that part of the country. Uh, you haven't been in that part of the country. Well, it's not that far outside of... Uh, it's in Covington, Indiana. So it's like uh, east of Danville. Okay. I guess I have. Crawfordsville. On like it's between Danville and Crawfordsville. I don't know that I've been there either. I lived in Indianapolis for a couple months for a post grad internship, but uh, I'm I'm writing it down right now because uh, I might have yeah. to stop there either on the way there or on the way back. Yeah, uh, I've I've heard nothing but good things about it. So, um, Covington, Covington, Indiana, and, and the website is beefhouserolls.com. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyways, oh, okay. uh, I know that really has a lot to do with the game. I just thought I'd add that in. So what's your, I'm curious, what's, uh, are you and Adam both, you both credentialed for the game? Yep. Yep. We're both going. Awesome. Well, yeah, uh, very much looking forward to it. Safe travels. Um, Mark, I, I wish that, my only wish is that you are also going. I, I said that to you a few weeks ago. I know you've got other conference championship games to cover, but um, this should be a, an experience. And like somebody said in the chat earlier, this may be Iowa's last chance, like ever, <laughs> to go to this game. Because frankly, uh, let's think about it. Even if you didn't have divisions this year before the expansion, how, how often would Iowa, well, they wouldn't. They, when would they have ever made the championship game as long as Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State are playing? You'd never make the top two of the conference. 2015, technically, sure but their schedule yeah. would have been different, of course. Yeah, okay. Well, that's no. exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> right. The schedule would have been different. And um, let's see, who were their crossover opponents in 15? You want to do a quick trivia, Mark? Uh, they it played, certainly wasn't Ohio State. I know that. I, they played Maryland. They played Indiana. And they played, let's see, Maryland, Indiana. They did not play Penn State, did not play Rutgers, did not play Michigan. Who, who was their other? Uh, or wait, no, we had we had eight conference games, so they only had the oh. two. <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so they they played Ma- Ma- sorry Maryland and Indiana. So there you go, Mark. Yeah, it was a light touch that year. <laughs> it uh, most definitely was. They uh, played a total of two ranked teams in the regular season, and one of them was Northwestern, where they won 40 to 10. Yeah, that was the game that Kirk brought up, I think, during his press conference, didn't he, Elliot, this week? He said no. something about uh, – Maybe. C- I don't know. I know you weren't you weren't covering the beat back then, but he, he brought up CJ kind of being hampered, and they – they, he was, yeah, I think he used the term concerned or worried, but he was worried going into that game because that was a good Northwestern team. And that was, I think, a three touchdown day for Akron Wadley, and they just hammered Northwestern. And was, yeah, were you going through the regular season there, or did that include Michigan State in the Big Ten championship? Oh, just the regular season. Yeah, Michigan okay. State was Wisconsin. number five. Was that the other that one? There. Wisconsin yeah, was, was the other one. I think Stanford was top 25, right, Mark? Yeah, I think they snuck <laughs> into the top twenty-five. All right, they, they <laughs> yeah. got there. I think their running back was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That was a fake idea of college football era, wasn't it? I'll tell you what, uh, Colin Coward. I'm surprised. I said this to Mark the other day. I I can't believe that Colin Coward hasn't jumped back on that this week, this year, because I think this this team this is now this is going to sound controversial, but this schedule, relatively speaking, I think was worse the way they won games has been worse than they won in 15 quarterback play has been worse. Like if anybody's going to call anybody the fake idea of college football, it would be Iowa this year, not 15 this year, at least in 15, they had guys like Bethard and Kittle and King. And I mean, they had got Josie jewel. They had dudes, they have dudes this year too, but I mean, not like those dudes. Well, they're top three like dudes are on the sideline and crutches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Luke Lachey, Eric all and Cooper. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My my guess on why Cal Hurd hasn't talked about Iowa is because he only cares about who's competing for a national championship. That's that's all his show deals with is if you're going to reach the playoff, if you get a chance. If Iowa had won the Minnesota game, if that would have been flipped. Then I'm just going to say that they yeah. might be on his radar. Would yeah. you ever? Could you get Colin on this show, Mark? Have you had? Have you ever reached out to him? No, I have not reached out to Colin Cowherd. I would love for you to do that. <laughs> Did you ever did you ever run into him when you're during your time at ESPN? Sure. Yeah. I used to okay. talk to him. Did you have uh pleasantries or were they absolutely wasn't like we were arguing in the hall or anything? <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm just curious. I'd love to get him on this show. Um I, I think what would be great is and, and I'll tell you what, uh this show would be would take the next step, Mark. On your main channel, you get like a panel of like Josh Pate, Colin Cowherd, Dan Patrick, um, Dave. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Pollock. I've gotten one of those. Okay, we've had Josh get, Pate on a few times. Get Paul on there. Clark. Yeah, Elliot. No, nobody. Of course. Yeah. Then, uh, I don't know if we can. <laughs> if we can get him, if we can get Clough, I don't know if we can get him. But and then get the rest of those guys, and then add Steve Dace to the mix, and you'd have a show right there, Mark. <laughs> By the way, did I haven't listened to the Steve no Dace pressure. yesterday? But somebody told me that he made a comment about nobody on Iowa's team would start for Michigan. Is that true that he said that? He said something close to that. He said excluding their injuries, taking those injured guys off the table. So Jay Jay Higgins wouldn't start? First team all Big Ten wouldn't start for Michigan? I think Michigan only starts two linebackers and maybe. Of course he's going to play. I, okay. I don't know. Well, I'm just curious. So the, I'm just, I don't even know who their linebackers Michael are. Michael Barrett, they're, Junior Colson. There are they, are they both, were they both first team all big 10? You got to understand to a certain extent, there's a difference between who votes for first and second team versus who coaches are saying they're going to be playing. Okay. I understand that, but I'm just simply saying, okay. Jay Higgins uh, so, is a tremendous player. I'm not taking that away from him <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not, uh, in a position to evaluate Michigan's linebackers to the extent that I can compare them to Jay Higgins. Yes. That would probably be my one. Sure. When I heard that, that would be the one. If, if, if he was taking injuries into account, then I can kind of understand it with the exception being, I think Jay Higgins is just exceptional. Yes. He was taking Lachey and all out of the I mix mean, and the gene, of course. You'd really have to think about Nick Jackson for a second as well. He's been phenomenal these last, especially these last few games. And I mean, the you got a five star safety on this back end. Granted, he's in his second year, uh, but but 
when you're talking about top end and potential, especially Xavier Wampa, I mean, I know he didn't get any conference awards or anything, but like, and Sebastian Castro was freaking exactly. amazing this year. I don't know yeah. how the coaches left him off the call conference awards and it was just media. That was insane to me. Well, you guys are smarter than the coaches, Elliot. Let me just say this, uh, as it relates to punter. Damn right. <laughs> are you telling me that are you telling me that Tory Taylor wouldn't start for Michigan, Mark? Oh, well, <laughs> am I telling you that? Well, <laughs> no, you're I'm saying did you, to challenge, Steve Dace. did you challenge Stevie on that? Yes. <laughs> I, well, no, I did not challenge him because I just thought I just kind of scanned and thought offense, defense, da, 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 da. okay, I'm not really going to challenge him there. We know Sebastian Castro, Joe Evans, those guys would be in the rotation. They'd be in there playing a ton of football. Yes. I think we all know that. But Michigan's got a really good punter. He's not Tory Taylor, but he's well, really good. I also think it's fair to say, Mark, that, uh, you know, you could argue certain players like a Joe Evans, had he spent his whole career at Michigan, might not be as good as he is now. In fact, there's a good chance he's not because I think Iowa's – is it fair to say Iowa is probably better at developing guys? <laughs> like, I mean, I, you know, I mean, that's – I know Michigan fans will probably get angry about that, but – you know, who's taking two and three star guys and putting them in the league at a high rate? Who's taking four and five star guys and putting them in the league at, the, at a high rate? So we just don't know what Michigan's ability to develop quite like we do about with Iowa's. So like Joe and Joe Evans wouldn't have had the opportunity to play as much. But remember, we had this conversation about Ohio State when you found the numbers. I forget who produced the numbers of schools that had produced the most three stars to the yes. NFL over yeah, the last the maybe the the college I, football playoff era, something yeah, like that. That's like the stat of the year for me. And that Ohio State was number two was pretty significant because they hardly sign any three stars. And that tells me that they obviously can develop. And that tells me they're pretty darn good at evaluating. They signed one last year. They They are identifying any of the – they are just identifying guys, right? They're four and five star guys. It's like, yep, they're yeah. they're four or five star guys. But then it's like, oh, they missed this guy, this guy, this guy. And it's like, yep, they sure did. <laughs> that's that's a testament to Ohio State. Who is Iowa's best offensive lineman? Uh, don't ask. Yeah, I, I, just, I feel like the, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have an answer to that question, Elliot. Do you have an answer to that? I mean, that's a problem. There yes, are several. There are several games this year where one of them looked atrocious. Like Mason Richmond, you'd think your left tackle would be solid, but there were, I think it was the Penn State game. He was just taken to school. Yeah, he was. And Logan, Logan Jones. Jones I, yeah. Go ahead. I, I know. Mean, I, I mean, scared. Logan Jones has been out, and I think there was too much hype around him heading into the year. Jennings Dunker is probably st – I still think he's not a natural tackle. I don't, I don't know. He's playing right tackle. Colby got pinned on his butt last week on field goal co uh, coverage. So I don't know. I, I, I Rusty Feth has been a pleasant surprise. <laughs> I, I don't think you could call him the best offensive lineman, though, either. I mean, he was rotating snaps with Nick DeYoung and like yeah. Tyler Ellsbury in relief of Logan Jones has been awesome. Yeah, he's been good. He's been good. He was good at guard last year. I thought he played a little bit. I don't think he played enough last year. I think he's been dealing with. Did he? I think he had an injury coming into the year or something, I but yeah. that I, that also might be completely wrong. But um, he, I think he's been really good at center. Haven't had any really uh, slip ups or anything with the snap. Obviously, Deacon fell over himself a couple of times or over a, a, a lineman, lineman's leg. I think that was against Illinois. Um, no, that was, that was that was Nebraska twice. Yep. Yeah, the one would have been a safety had he not made some acrobatic move to get that ball into the hands of his running back right um so uh, Corey, did you see the end of uh, it was a presser it might have been the Rutgers game uh, everything runs together with me at this point in time in the season it's just uh, tunnel vision going forward but anyway um Kirk said something about getting Deacon into a fitness program in the off season I, yeah I did hear that I don't know if that was said in jest um my question would be uh, why was that not done during this last off season. Yeah. I, right? and that might've been a scenario where you're just trying to get him 
you know, integrated with the offense and such, but you know, that should happen over spring because he got there in spring. Um, but, and who knows, maybe they did try it. I, who knows? I don't, I don't. I asked the offensive line question because of the days comment made me think offensive line, Iowa offensive line. And even though that's the narrative, as Corey there's nobody, has, there's nobody on that old line that would start at Michigan. As Corey has schooled me on, that narrative is an old one and it's outdated. And we've seen, yeah, subpar play along the offensive line. But it also reminds me that the Michigan offensive line has not been stellar the last four or five games. And I really think that Iowa has an opportunity there. I've been watching the Hawkeyes probably five, six consecutive games, and I think they really have an opportunity along the defensive front to cause havoc, make Again, plays. I'll, I'll put a promo in for the show with Don because that's funny you say that. He did say, I asked him specifically, I think this was on the air, and I'm pretty sure you wouldn't mind me repeating this. Um, he said the right side of that line before what's-his-face went down last week. What's the name of the guy who's out? Um, was he a uh, guard? Right uh, guard? Zach Zinter. Okay, before Zinter oh. went down, Don said that, he had seen some vulnerabilities from, I think, the right tackle. Carson Barnhart. Okay, and is he moving inside now? Did I hear that right? He moved to left guard. I might have that wrong. Okay, We talked about this on my podcast with Trevor McHugh that went out today. I couldn't tell you the specifics of it, but he said that, you know, unfortunately given the circumstances, but that might have made the offensive line overall better the moving around that's happened in this last week. Well, that's interesting because Don just said, you know, hey, if the the right tackle didn't look great before and your right guard is now down and they're shuffling, the right side of that line could have some vulnerabilities in there. So um, I'll be interested to see how much pressure Phil dials up. My guess is he won't dial up very much early. But, uh, and Iowa hasn't, let's be honest, Iowa's not gotten home much with a four-man front. So, they're going to have to dial pressure up if they're going to get home on, on McCarthy. McCarthy's not one. I think you said it earlier. Uh, he doesn't like to throw the ball away. And, you know, so that will be interesting to see if they can kind of coax him into making some, some poor decisions. And just like we talk about unconventional or non-traditional touchdowns, whether it's a kick return or a punt return, what if you get a, a Joe Evans strip sack or you get a, you know, a Sebastian Castro you know, jumped route and he, he runs one in for 10 yards, you know, if they pin him back and you get an interception or something back there, boy, it changes the game. How many safeties has Iowa had this year? You know? So that's how Iowa's won games. They just figure out a way to get points on the board. You mentioned the right side of the field. What I've been told as well, or the right side of the offensive line, rather. So what I've been told as well is if you can push McCarthy to his left, that's what you're going to want. You're going to want to get him out of the pocket and moving left as opposed to right. Obviously, I mean, that just kind of goes with right-handed quarterbacks, right? But um, so, you know, there's there's something to be aware of right there. Well, Mark, I'll let you guys finish this thing out unless you have anything else for me. I'm going to hop off and try to get my affairs in order before, before I take off tomorrow. So uh, anything else you got for me? I don't. Uh, just have a good trip. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing your post game and everything else uh, from Indy. And Elliot, we'll see you there. See you there. We'll have to grab a drink or something after the game so we can, uh, well, so you can drown your tears. <laughs> no, you're, you're. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, we'll, we'll figure something out. I'll, 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 uh, I'll touch base with you. We'll be there. Uh, we'll be there Friday night and uh, leaving Sunday. So sounds good. Good talking to you, Corey. Thank you, sirs. Thanks, Corey. Elliot, I know you need to go. Can we grab these super chats real quick? Thank you, uh, Jess Lee. Two, three. Thank you. Uh, could you guys address the Jason Garrett rumors? Do we know what, what those are? I have no idea what those are. Okay. You mentioned it at the top of the show. I am locked in on Iowa. I, yeah, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, "What's your take on like?" Luka Doncic doing whatever. I don't freaking know. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> I only read that meaning are those Jason Garrett rumors connected to Iowa. That's the only reason I would have uh, served that up for you. Never heard that. Okay, Not one yeah. time. Uh, 
Yes. So Jesley23, thank you for the contribution, but uh, we've got nothing on Jason Garrett. I can tell you about Jason Garrett with the Dallas Cowboys, but I, yes, nothing toward the future. Erica, thank you so much for the five spot here. I can see special teams making a play and Castro will be all over the field as usual. Higgins and Jackson will also do their thing. Thank you for that, Erica. Stephen, here's a contribution towards the channel. Just observing today. Good luck to Iowa. Stephen, thank you so much for that. Do you have a percentage chance that you're giving Iowa to win this game? Oh, gosh. <laughs> like 10, probably. Yeah. I, I looked at ESPN just to get the um, the over-under and, and uh, the spread yesterday before we recorded our podcast. Um, Hotcast, by the way, if you want to check it out, it is on YouTube as well as Apple Podcast, Spotify, all that. But um, they give Iowa a seven point four percent chance to win. Yeah. So, man, like I, I mean, I, I, I think that sentiment of everything has to go right, Iowa has to be perfect, really sums it up. I mean, do you see anything? I mean, you ask me, Mark, but like. Do you think I'm I'm right there when I say everything has to go perfect? Yeah, because one thing I was going to ask you was, do you go the route of, okay, we've got to play Iowa football to the hilt. To the hilt, meaning we run the play clock down to one. Every time we snap the ball, we squeeze this and we just play so conservatively and do our thing. Or do you just break tendencies left and right and go crazy and throw the kitchen sink at them? you probably need to do this in a calculated way as, as throw the kitchen sink at Michigan because 7%, you don't, that's, that reminds me of when Iowa went to Ohio state, were you covering the Hawkeyes last year or is this year, first year in the beat? First year. When they on went the to beat. Ohio state last year, you know, in, in doing all the many shows Corey and I do during the off season, I, I remember telling him they're going to be a 25 point underdog in that game. And he just, and I even thought re that was ridiculous me saying that to him, but I just knew the, you know, the, just the projection of both teams. And he's like, no way. No, no, no. There, there'll be a two touchdown underdog. There'll be a 17 point dog. It gets to the game. They're a 30 point underdog. That's just unbelievable. A team that's as good as Iowa. They go to Columbus. They're a 30 point underdog. Well, they lost by 44 points. So it's in this, and I think of the psychological portion of this. And I think, I don't know if you saw this out of the Michigan cornerback. He said last week's game was the big 10 championship, you know, talking about the Ohio State game. That. Um, but two years ago, if there would have been a letdown spot for Michigan, it would have been two years ago. That's the first time they beat Ohio state. You know, that game was just everything to them to finally break through that. My thought that week was, Oh, they, they might have a letdown here. Uh, 42 to three. So yep. I think this is more in the 27, 10 range. I think it'll be respectable. Yeah. You know, I think I, yeah, what I said yesterday, I said 33, six a couple days ago. Now I'm down to 27, six, just because again, what I was told by, by Trevor is just that he thinks they're fully com Michigan's fully comfortable playing Iowa football in this game. Like just running the clock down, score, but they'll be more efficient. That's the thing is Iowa football is not efficient. Uh, Michigan football can be efficient with the way you're able to run the ball with Donovan Edwards and Blake Corum and with the way that J.J. McCarthy – I mean, you watch the Ohio State game. I'm sure that ball that he snuck between those two DBs to Roman Wilson, that was unreal. I haven't seen a throw like that. I don't know the last time I saw a throw like that. Threw it about three inches over the guy's helmet. <laughs> It was wild. And, and that was, Elliot, not to cut you off, that was even more impressive when you take the shot behind the quarterback because not only did he lace it down the field, when he threw it, there were like hands and traffic in his face and he even like changed his arm angle to get it through the window of the line to get it downfield. It's like Patrick Mahomes type stuff. Man. Yes. I mean, can he'll throw and pass. Do we have him on tape doing something like that? No, <laughs> I, I don't have to do any research to tell you that he has made. I think it was the Illinois game. He did make some 
pretty wild throws in into some windows that we did not see before. I was sitting in a press box with Adam and a, a couple of the other media guys, and I leaned back and I was like, I think Deacon Hill sold his soul to the devil because like <laughs> Deacon Hill six weeks ago is not making these throws. Um, but again, that wasn't against Ohio State. That was against Illinois, right? Like, and it was to Nico Ragaini, you know, not Roman Wilson. They weren't scoring on on plays like this. So you just there's only so much trust you can put in Deacon Hill to make plays, right? I mean, like with Caleb Brown on the field, that makes you more inclined to say, yeah, that maybe something can happen. But with with Deacon Hill under center. It's just I, I just don't see it happening I, on a consistent enough basis for them to to make enough plays to win the football game. Elliot, great stuff out of you. Appreciate you stopping by. Know that you're running down a zillion different things at the same time. I could hit you up on recruiting and everything else, but we'll we'll catch that down the line. We got National Signing Day about uh, two to three weeks away, so plenty of time to catch up with that. Yes, sir. Good talking to you, Mark. I appreciate Thanks, you Elliot. having me. Yeah, have a good trip. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Elliot Clough, Iowa Rivals. Check out his work. Again, Iowa Rivals, it's easy to find. It's all over the place. Uh, Elliot doing a great job covering the Hawkeyes. Check out the video that I posted. It's on the main channel. I did an Iowa-Michigan comp on points again. So this is a six-game comparison of their six common opponents. Point differential passing yardage per game, rushing yardage per game, pass defense per game, rushing defense per game, differential in yardage, first downs, uh, differential there, third and fourth down efficiency on offense, third down efficiency and fourth down efficiency on defense, turnover margin, even special teams. I even went into special teams and return yardage, sizing up Michigan and Iowa. Check it out. It's on the main channel. You'll see me doing one of these weighing the helmets like and don't take it from the thumbnail because i think i get the michigan helmet slightly higher than the iowa helmet but uh the the yeah the iowa michigan comp is on the main channel as well as oh i have not produced the alabama georgia comp i've gone through all the numbers i need to do that as well all right appreciate you being here at the voice of college football uh post game we'll be here with Corey and coach patterson after the game and uh Look forward to that as well. Good luck, Hawkeyes. Michigan fans, appreciate you being here as well. As always, we've got you you know, front and center there on the shelf. So that's always a distinguished position to be in. We'll see you next time here at the Voice of College Football. We believe the next live show, we've got our Clemson guys lined up at 7 p.m. Eastern time over on the Clemson channel. So be looking out for that. All sorts of good stuff lined up for Friday, including post-game after Oregon, Washington on the main channel. We'll take your calls after the Pac-12 championship game over on the main channel. Appreciate you being here. We will see you soon.